Coming up right now on Lifestyle Magazine, you're about to hear from people whose revolutionary ideas replaced retribution with reconciliation. Now, here's the host of Lifestyle Magazine, Mike Tucker. Welcome. My guest today is Lisa Ray. She is the founder and president of the Justice and Reconciliation Project. Welcome to Lifestyle Magazine. Thanks for having me. You bet. Now tell us a little something about yourself, your background. Well, I've been in the California legislature mm -hmm. working for three, uh, three legislators in the 80s and also been a lobbyist. And I worked for Justice Fellowship, which is a sister organization to Prison Fellowship Ministries. That's something we all recognize. So uh, tell me about your organization, Justice and Reconciliation Foundation. Is that did I get that right? The, the Justice and Reconciliation Project. Project, okay. And it's a national nonprofit organization, and we work with victims of violent crime, okay. and we promote restorative justice. Mm -hmm. But we work across the United States and also outside the country to promote victims-driven restorative justice. Now, what is restorative justice? Well, it's a new vision for the criminal justice system. Okay. Right now, when we respond to crime in mm -hmm. the United States, we say crime is a crime against the state. Right. And that the offender has to pay back the state by serving time often. Right. But it's not a crime against a victim, a crime against a real human being. Right. Restorative justice says we're going to turn that on its head. So it's a paradigm shift that says, no, the offender needs to be held accountable to the victim. To the victim. And the victim, as much as possible, the criminal justice system needs to understand that Crime injures victims and crime injures communities. So restorative justice says, what can we do to change that paradigm and hold mm -hmm. the offender accountable, but also restore and heal the victim as much as possible? That's a, that's a new concept, isn't it? I mean, it's a, it's a new paradigm for us. It is new. It's been around actually since the 70s in the United States and in Canada. Yeah. But it's really a, uh, an approach to crime that's that comes out of indi indigenous cultures. Mm -hmm. um, so, and it's also biblically based. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's why I come to this work right. is as a Christian. Mm -hmm. And uh, but the idea of injury caused and that the offender needs to make things right. Are mm -hmm. they doing that today? Are are offenders held accountable in that way? Mm -hmm. for violent crime when they serve time in, in a prison or in a county jail. Now, some people tell us that you're soft on crime. Uh, they tell us that this project is nothing more than an opportunity for a criminal to further victimize the victims of the crime in the first place. How, how would you answer those concerns? Um, it, it's so far from the truth. What The hardest thing for an offender to do is mm -hmm. take responsibility for his uh, actions. Mm -hmm. And it's hard for an offender to sit in front of the victim that he has injured, especially in violent crime, and say, I'm sorry for what I did. It's so critical for offenders to come to a point of remorse after an offense has been committed. Right. And, and in prison or in county jail, often um, perpetrators don't think of their victims. They don't think of them. People say, well, how can that be? How can that be? Well, our system doesn't lead them there. Mm -hmm. And if, if it's an offender that's caused many um, crimes, committed many crimes, it's, it's just something they're not thinking about. And we don't lead them to that point to, to take responsibility directly mm -hmm. for their actions. So how do you do that? How do you lead a criminal who's in prison to begin to think about their victim? Well, there are programs called Victim Offender Reconciliation Programs or Victim Offender Dialogue. There are many types of names for programs or processes that reflect restorative justice, and that's one example. Mm -hmm. And that, in that, in those cases, victim offender mediation, you'd have a trained mediator sitting down with the victim and the offender, okay. and they'd actually uh, meet and discuss what occurred. And what you really want to happen is that, or what victims we work with um, tell us, and I've seen, is that victims have questions. They have unanswered questions, yeah. number one, because so often the public, say, public will say, well, why would a victim of violent crime want to sit down with the offender? With the offender, yeah. So someone murdered another, a family member, why would the victim want to sit down with the offender? Well, they have questions. That's number one. What kind of questions do they ask? Why, why did you target my family? Yeah. What, were you, what were you thinking? Uh, when you killed my loved one, what did they say at the end? What did they, how did they look? All of these questions that are unanswered. And that, that pain, that anguish follows them throughout their life. Yeah. And, you know, so, yeah. Does it help them to get the answers oh, to this? Oh, yes. It really does. Oh, yes. I could tell you many stories. You're going to talk to Russ Turner, who works yeah. with our organization, and he'll explain it. But, yes, it, it brings, it's not closure. It, it brings a measure of healing. 
And also, um, often what we find is victims realize that there's something in it for them to forgive. I understand that there's a project like this working in Texas now. Uh, well, and it's called Sycamore Tree, Sycamore, the Sycamore Tree. Tree Project, and it's still in operation in Texas. Mm -hmm. I directed it, um, the first pilot project, in 1998. Mm -hmm. and, um, uh, what does this do? Uh, what, what is, what's the nature of the project? Well, it brings victims and offenders together, okay. surrogate victims uh -huh. and surrogate offenders, so not related cases. But the, the focus, the purpose of the project is actually to expose offenders to the pain that victims go through. So, so these offenders did not offend the victims that you're putting them with, That's but they right. did offend someone, That's right? That's right. And, they, and, and the pilot that I ran in 1998, it was uh, victims of violent crime and mm -hmm. offenders who committed largely violent Violent offenses. crimes. Yes. And so now now they're talking to real-life victims right. and looking at their pain. What have, what have uh, their responses been? They, uh, it was amazing because uh, the victims that were in the program in the Sycamore Tree Project, when they came into the project, they were extremely suspicious yeah. and very, very nervous. As about, I can imagine. They, they said, well, I don't know if I should be here. Yeah. Um, what will this do to me? But then there was a curiosity. Mm -hmm. And so by the end of the project, they, they were singing the praises of restorative right? justice. Absolutely. And many of them wanted to actually meet with their own offenders. Well, before we uh, go to break, what's your website? It's www.thejrp.org. Thank you. Coming up after this break, we'll talk to a man whose personal quest takes our vision of reconciliation to new levels. Stay with us. We learned English. Your kids can too. Just watch Hello Channel. Dr. Miroslav Volf is professor of theology and the director of the Center for Faith and Culture at Yale University. He joins us by satellite from the Broadcast Center at Yale. Dr. Wolf, thank you for joining us today. I'm delighted to be with you. Dr. Wolf, in your book, The End of Memory, you tell the story of a Yugoslavian officer who tormented you, someone that you had an imaginary reconciliation with. Would you tell us that story briefly? Well, I was conscripted into Yugoslavian military service and um, because my father was a prominent uh, minister, because uh, I studied abroad, because my wife was an American citizen, because I was working on a dissertation on Karl Marx, I was an object of suspicion. And so they organized the whole unit around spying on me, and that's what went on for about um, three months or so. And then uh, interrogation started. Uh, any time of night or day, they would come and summon me and uh, then interrogate me, threatening with uh, eight years of imprisonment because I've said this or that thing about Tito, or I have praised uh, a soldier who was um, refusing to bear arms or something of that sort. Uh, they were trying to see whether I'm a politically what they would have called subversive element. Hmm. But then you found it necessary to try to reconcile with that man, with one of the officers who really tormented you, is that correct? Yeah, there was a particular man who was always present and he was a security officer on the base uh, on which I was serving. And uh, he was in charge of those interrogations. And as you can imagine, uh, during interrogations, um, I didn't feel particularly cozy with that uh, man. I didn't want to necessarily to embrace him uh, or have dinner uh, with him. Yeah. And when I left also um, military service, uh, he continued to live in my imagination as my tormentor. Mm. And uh, my own sense is that uh, being a Christian requires of us to reconcile with our enemies, to live in peace with everyone. And so I thought I needed to deal with that situation, not just with my own internal turmoil, mm -hmm. but also with the relationship that was established between us during those months. So you tried to find this man? I did try to find, uh, find the man. Uh, I, I must say I didn't try terribly vigorously to find him, <laughs> but I did. I spent some time right. trying to find him. But you were unable and to? I was unable to find him. and. Uh, so I thought I needed to kind of enact this reconciliation in my own imagination. And that's, in a sense, how the book ends. The uh, book starts with a report of uh, interrogations and my own feelings about it. 
then throughout the book uh, I tell vignettes from uh, our encounters and then toward the end I in a sense in the imagination enact a reconciliation. Right. A reconciliation which I hope uh, will be possible one day. Yes. Now why not just forgiveness? Why all the way to reconciliation? Well, you know, forgiveness takes care of the past, uh, takes, takes care of the injury that has happened in the, in the past and uh, kind of puts us back into a situation as if that injury had not happened, ideally. Though, of course, forgiveness is never so, uh, so complete. Uh, but for reconciliation, you need, uh, you need a bit more. You need a step toward the person, not simply to remove the obstacle that has been created, but also to move toward the person and uh, create a fellowship that was broken by, uh, by the injury. You recognize in our world today, most people think forgiveness is an impossibility, much less reconciliation. What do you say to those people? You know, forgiveness is difficult, uh, and sometimes it uh, feels like it is an impossibility. And I think we often have experienced that when we forgive, we, we forgive partially, then what we forgive, we take back. We forgive going in circle, we forgive and take back, and, and it's, a, it's a struggle, consistent struggle mm -hmm. to forgive. Um, and I think the same is true with reconciliation, which is even more difficult. Uh, we struggle to do that, but my sense is that uh, any partial forgiveness is a good forgiveness. Okay. Any partial reconciliation is a good reconciliation. Mm -hmm. It's a good step. And so I think if we do not approach this with excessive expectations, as if we'll just forgive and everything's going to be fine, as if we'll just embrace and everything's going to be fine, I think we can make progress. How can forgiveness and reconciliation coexist with memory of that which has happened? Well, memories uh, are a very significant part of who we are. Uh, they shape our very identity, and uh, forgiveness itself uh, requires a memory, requires for us to remember what has been done to us uh, and to go through that event as we forgive it. I think the same is true of reconciliation. There is no way for either forgiveness or reconciliation to happen without naming transgression as transgression. Once we name it, once we agree on it, then it can be released again. And I think we have the similar model embodied in the story of Jesus Christ who dies on the cross for sins of the world. God does not just disregard human sin, uh, Christ bears human sin. Christ names human sin and bears it and that's what makes reconciliation possible. The same is true, I think, in relationship between human beings. If there's someone out there who is hurting right now because they've been uh, victimized, what would you say to encourage them to go to the steps of both forgiveness and reconciliation? As a Christian, I would say, look on the cross. Look what Christ, what God in Christ has done for you on the cross and meditate on what that might mean for you as you relate to your own assailant. Dr. Wolf, we cannot thank you enough for being here with us today. Thank you so much. I'm delighted. Coming up, a story of tragedy and healing right after this short break. Hello, my name is Javier. I'm from Spain. I learned English. So can you. Watch Hello Channel. If you would like Dr. Volt's book, The End of Memory, go to our website at lifestyle.org and there we'll give you the information you need to find that book. Right now joining us is Russ Turner to talk about his personal road to reconciliation. Welcome. Welcome. Glad Thank, to hear, you. Russ. Thank you for having me. Now tell us your story. Your son was, was killed? Yeah. The, um, the simple fact was a young man made a bad choice. He was on six uh, 40 ounce malt liquors, three or four lines of meth, a couple of joints and two light beers. Oh, Going about 120 miles an hour. My son made a right turn on the wrong street at the wrong time. Uh, his death was instant. That was, that was a blessing. Uh, nine months later, uh, well, it, it was a Saturday morning, coroner knocked on the door. Our, my son answered the door and I remember hearing him run upstairs and say to his mom, 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 there's been an accident. And she said, it's not, a, it's not funny, it's not a joke. And uh, subsequent to that was the next nine months and a trial and a young man who fled the scene of the accident mm. uh, was later captured, went to trial 
and uh, then came the day of sentencing. How, how old was your son when he died? My son, Jeremy, was 19 and a half, and Stephen, and half. Stephen was 23. Oh, my. So you went to the trial? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. As the trial progressed, we got to sentencing. Uh, Stephen got a sentence of 17 to life. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's a stiff sentence. He got yes, convicted of murder too because that's the way the law deemed this act right. of uh, negligence. But it's interesting, in this criminal justice process, I remember going to the DA and saying, we want to tell this young man he's forgiven. I forgave the man the day the coroner closed the door. Now, now hang on <laughs> just a second here. So obviously this is the most devastating experience of your life. You've lost your son. Right. The, the emotions have got to be overwhelming. Yeah, I, I, I would not for a second say it isn't painful. I just know for me and my personal experience later for my wife, when we shut the door, I prayed, Lord, forgive this man. I don't know where he is. I know he's on the run, but uh, I forgive him. And I only think that's because I have hope for, for what my son believed. For the, the ability to do that had something to do with what we believed. Was there no anger, no resentment towards this you know, man? No, there really wasn't. <laughs> That's an incredible thought to me. There was anger in the family. There was anger. My wife wasn't angry. She wasn't hostile toward him. She wanted justice. Yes. I wanted justice. I yes. wanted the young man to be held accountable for his actions. But, but it wasn't, uh, there was no satisfaction, even during the trial, when friends would come to us and say, you know, we really hope he suffers in prison. And, yeah. it, and it's odd to say, but it didn't help me. When we were going through trial, those statements didn't make me they feel better. They thought they were helpful, and they were yeah. very kind, loving people. But their heart said, we want someone to pay because right. we're suffering with you. I wanted my son back, and I wanted life to come back to normal. And, and it's a new normal. It wasn't going to. We met with the, the uh, probation officer, and he said at the time of sentencing, you can speak to the to court. You can speak to the defendant. He said, respect the court. You know, maybe talk about how this has impacted you. And I remember that day, I had sat up. The day before that, I had heard uh, someone on the radio. Uh, you know, it's interesting. When tragedy strikes, you either jump right to the heart of God or you get bitter. Yeah. And we'd had nine months now to, yeah, to process months. this information. And the day before, uh, this gentleman had said, if someone takes the life of your child and yes. you do everything you can to get even, it's vengeance. If you uh, uh, let the system do its job, it's justice. If you forgive them, it's grace. Mm -hmm. And God does it every day. And that really anchored for me what I was going to say the next day. I talked to the young man face to face at the sentencing. Now, it wasn't like you and I talking. Right. It was me talking to a young man at a table with his head down, head down. hearing what he was going to happen. He couldn't look you in the eye, could he? what was going to happen the rest of his life. Yeah. When I was talking about how much pain, I could hardly speak, came to the point when I decided what I was going to say, but I have hope for you because I know where my son is. I have hope that you'll find that same opportunity for forgiveness, for peace, for, for a life, you know, because if you find out what hope my son had. And that was, that how I was... Did, what, how did he respond to that? I, there was no response. No response. No. In fact, three years later, we got a letter. I remember the day somebody was selling us some Venetian blinds. Uh, my, mother, my wife was opening up uh, letters, and I physically saw her body change. I saw her, I don't know how to describe it. And I said, what is that? She said, it's a letter from Stephen. Stephen had written a letter of remorse. He had bucked the system. He found a way to get us a letter no. because the system really doesn't open the door for mm -hmm. offenders to communicate for fear of reoffending, right. if it's not valid, if they're not true, if they're manipulating. There's all kinds of reasons why. Right. But this man found a way through his mother, through a pastor, to get us a letter. I wrote him back and said, I have to speak to 4,000 kids in a year. Can I bring a camera, read your letter, say whatever you want to say? Wow. And he said, yes. What did the letter say? Oh, I, I, it was very remorseful. Yeah. He talked about his family, our family, the pain that he had caused. He was afraid to write. It was a very sincere letter. I wrote him back. He said, I said, he said to me, if you come to the prison, I'll do it. And there was a friend that was in town who I handed the letter to, and this gentleman was quite wise. He looked at me mm -hmm. and he said, do you know what he wants? I said, yeah, instinctively. He wants me to look him in the eye and say he's forgiven. Mm -hmm. And he says, are you ready to do that, to take that step? Mm -hmm. And I think that's what Lisa's been talking about. Mm -hmm. That's what the, the, the professor was talking about. Um, are you ready to take that step? Mm -hmm. And yes, I was ready to take that step. I think it was harder for him to face me in prison. He was level four. That's, that's as high as it goes. Mm -hmm. Two guards, two cameras. By a miracle, we got a camera in the system. Wow. And he came out and communicated. And the first thing I said to him when he got out of the door was, you have to know I'm not here in anger. I forgive you for this. Nine years later, we met a second time. And the outcome of that interview was a blessing to me. Yeah. At the end of about an hour and 17 minutes of talking, I asked Stephen, can you imagine my son embracing you, receiving you without hate? 
and through a broken face and, and uh, he said, when I was in trial, I had a dream. He came to my cell door. He was all burnt. You couldn't recognize him. And to a very calm voice, he said, it's going to be okay. He said, it shook me up. I called my mom. It was midnight. Uh, it just freaked him out. And I'm sitting here not expecting this. And all I could think of was Christ saying, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. I wasn't angry. It didn't beat me up. I had a new vision of what the spirit of my son or a spirit of reconciliation might look like. Mm -hmm. Here is a burn to the crisp body saying through a cell, uh, a cell door, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. I asked him a follow-up. I just said, well, if you got to see him, what would you say? He said, I would want to say, uh, he said, I just want to give him a hug. I've got to tell you, I got up out of the chair. I just had to hug the kid. Now, I, we've talked twice, sent a few letters. You can hug the man who killed your son and not hate him. And it has nothing to do with me. I, I am in awe. No, it's yeah. not me. Yeah. But the power of forgiveness and reconciliation sets me free from being in prison. I cannot thank you enough for your story. I really cannot. And we'll be right back with a final word in just a minute. This is Hello Channel. Come learn English as you watch TV. It will change your life. We've got time for just one final word. Russ? Well, you know, it was a probation officer that introduced me to Lisa and the JRP group. And they now are connecting us with other victims that have the same desire, the instinct that they need to forgive and reconcile. Right. And I would say forgiveness will set you free and reconciliation will, will make your life full and rich. Thank you. Lisa? Well, what our organization is trying to do is open doors for healing and restoration mm -hmm. of victims, offenders, and communities. Right. That's what we're doing around the country. So I ask for your support. I ask people, if they're victims, to look at our website and also offenders or our families of offenders mm -hmm. um, who want to go through this type of process. But we need to change laws to allow us to do it. Right. The story today was unusual. Mm -hmm. And I know there are a lot of hurting people out there that have similar experiences and they say, how do I get this? Right. Well, email us, call us, and we'll try to Work open together. the doors. But we Good. are working in Good. the legislatures and also on the federal level to change the laws to allow this to happen thank in our criminal so justice system. Thank you. And thank you for joining us today. If you'd like more information, go to our website at lifestyle.org and we'll see you again next time. Take care.